We have a third panelist. I apologize for beginning late, but our third panelist is running late. But we now know he's nearby, so we'll go ahead and start. And when he joins, uh, he'll be able to join. Uh, this morning we're having a hearing titled "Educational Milestones of Dyslexia" that will highlight the importance of early identification of students with dyslexia, how high stakes testing affects such students, and the need for appropriate accommodations. I'll make an opening statement then introduce our panel. Each panelist will have five minutes. That light right there, which you can, but hopefully, you cannot see, but hopefully they can. Uh, the green line is go. The yellow means you have one minute left. And the red light means wrap it up or else I'm gonna wrap you up. <laughs> <laughs> After our witness testimony, we'll begin with a round of questioning. Uh, first, thank y'all for being here. Uh, I see, Jill Dyson in the Moyne Rutledge from the school board. Thank you all for being here. Uh, and there's other educators here. Um, uh, my cousin is in the uh, audience, and so Sophie. Uh, so um, I thank you all. Um, I'm pleased to host this hearing to discuss the issue of dyslexia, an issue important to me as a parent and as a senator. Hey, Darius. Uh, my hope is to bring greater awareness and understanding of dyslexia to help drive new federal policies and to uh, create resources to help students identify as dyslexic. The goal of the hearing is to show the importance of the identification, how high stakes testing affects such dyslexic students, and the need for providing appropriate accommodations for dyslexics. Now first, the definition. Dyslexia is an unexpected difficulty in reading, highlighted by a gap between an individual's intelligence and the reading level. The bright child that cannot read. Or as I was speaking to someone in the audience, the bright adult who cannot read. An NIH study recently found that the prevalence rate of dyslexia is nearly 20%, affecting Americans, but it's international, uh, from all walks of life. Members of Congress, our staff, our members, thousands of constituents, 20% of us, and this Room, probably more than 20 percent. A recent GAO report found that many students, um, oh, I skipped. A couple years ago, my youngest daughter was diagnosed with dyslexia. So my wife and I set out to find out as much as we could and were amazed at how much is known and yet not incorporated into public policy. It is maddening. A recent GAO report found that many students with learning and other disabilities, including dyslexia, are not receiving accommodations such as extended testing time, which is required by the Americans with Disability Act, when they take high stakes testing, such as the SAT, GRE, LSAT, or US medical licensing exams, and others. This is unacceptable. And by working together, we can make sure that those with learning disabilities receive their proper and legally required accommodations. Now, for those with money, you can get that accommodation. If your child has dyslexia, dyslexia and you can afford ten to fifty thousand dollars in tuition, your child can have that accommodation. But for most families, that is not an option. And the question is whether, in a uh, typical public school, dyslexics are mainstreamed. And now, mainstream, since there is a scientific-based curriculum, which is just for dyslexics, mainstream quite likely means they will not receive the remediation. So, I applaud the schools and educators who have embraced science by providing students with the proper educational environment and curriculum that enables them to thrive personally and academically. Proper support at every level can make all the difference for a student struggling with a learning disability. Let me brag a little bit on Louisiana. I think there are maybe three charter schools in the nation, I only know for sure two, that specialize for children in dyslexia and two of them, those two are in Louisiana. The first was the Max Charter School in Thibodeau, um, and then the other is the Louisiana Key Academy here in Baton Rouge. And full disclosure, my wife helped start that, and there's some board members here who are on the LA Key Academy. But aside from being proud of my wife, I more importantly think that it's a good thing which extends access to that scientific curriculum to those who ordinarily would never be able to afford it. Uh, we need more of this. Now there's much work to be done in raising the awareness about dyslexia and making those policy changes, creating opportunities for all dyslexia. Uh, 
um, but we cannot afford to ignore those who are challenged. In the House of Representatives, I started the Congressional Dyslexia Caucus to raise awareness. Since moving to the Senate last week, joining with Senator Barbara Mikulski of Maryland, passed a bipartisan resolution that calls upon both Congress, schools, and state and local educational agencies to recognize the significant educational implications of dyslexia that must be addressed and which designated October 2015 as National Dyslexia Awareness Month. I hope this resolution is the first of many steps in the right direction. Now, despite great strides, we still have much to learn about dyslexia, and we have a great panel today to speak to us on that subject. Let me now introduce the witnesses. I'll start with the two right there. Uh, Dr. Sally and Bennett Shaywitz were to join us, and circumstances may uh, have worked out that they could not. They are currently at Yale. I think you see that banner above Bennett's head. Um, and uh, and uh, they will be joining us via video, obviously. Um, Sally, I'll first speak to her, is the Audrey G. Rathner Professor in Learning Development at Yale University School of Medicine and co-director of the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity. Dr. Shaywitz has authored more than 200 scientific articles and books, and together with her husband, Dr. Bennett Shaywitz, is the originator of the Sea of Strengths model of dyslexia. Dr. Shaywitz is also an elected member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. She received her bachelor's degree from the City University and medical degree from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Dr. Bennett Shaywitz is the Charles and Henry Schwab Professor in Dyslexia and Learning Development and co-director of the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity. Uh, he has devoted his career to better understanding and elucidating the neurobiological basis of reading and dyslexia to ensure that this new knowledge is translated into better care and treatment by children and adults who are dyslexic. Dr. Shaywitz has offered more than 300 scientific papers and has received many honors for his contribution. Uh, contributions. He currently serves on the Scientific Advisory Board of the March of Dimes and the National Vaccine Program Office Safety Subcommittee. He received his bachelor's degree from Washington University and his medical degree from Washington University School of Medicine. Next here, Dr. Montgomery, Trevor Montgomery. He is a nationally recognized educational advocate, entrepreneur, and social change influencer. Reverend Montgomery was born and raised in Louisiana, where he attended both Baton Rouge Community College in LSU, majored in marketing and a minor in business administration. He's currently enrolled in the New Orleans Theological Seminary. And an ordained minister, Reverend Montgomery attends the Greater King David Church in Baton Rouge, serving as an associate minister. Uh, Elise Trapp. Ms. Trapp is a senior at LSU from home. She is majoring in mass communications, minoring in history and business administration. She is involved in several extracurricular activities, including student government. Uh, we're interested in hearing your perspective as someone with dyslexia who's been able to arrive and who's able, been able to do so well in the university setting. And then lastly, Ms. Margaret Law. Uh, Margaret is currently the district dyslexia and 504 coordinator in, at Central Community Schools she earned her bachelor's degree from LSU and is a certified academic language therapist. Her teaching expertise spans from first through twelfth grades in both self-contained classes and as an academic language therapist. She also provides multisensory structured language services and has presented at conferences and workshops. We are glad to have Margaret here to brief us on the needs of teachers who are vital to the success of students with dyslexia. Now, if I may suggest to you three, as I mentioned to you two, the Reverend, Y'all may want to sit there as the shade went to speak because they'll have slides. I'm actually going to reference those as I didn't ask you questions. Uh, and I think Bennett, you went early, you went first earlier, so but I will turn to you two to decide what to do next. Uh, thank you so much, Cindy, and uh, welcome to all our other panel members. What we'd like to do in the next few minutes is give you a sense of how dyslexia serves as an explanation and potential solution to our national epidemic of reading in school and the problem, as, as uh, Senator Cassidy outlined, is that there's a really a national epidemic of reading and academic failure. Science has shown that dyslexia may be at the root of these reading difficulties. 
but yet schools are not using the scientific knowledge to address and remediate these problems. We think, and I think you will all agree, that schools really need to increase their awareness of dyslexia. Here is data from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, the so-called nation's report to our grade four reading and most recent um, iteration. And you can see that about half of African-American children, African-American fourth graders, are not reading, are reading below considered basic reading levels compared to a still a significant percentage, 21% of, of white students. So I think this, this emphasizes that dyslexia is especially prevalent and unrecognized in children of color and children who are disadvantaged. In these children, reading difficulties are often written off to environmental issues or lack of ability. We believe that these can be addressed and remediated, but only if the child is identified as dyslexic. Senator Cassidy mentioned the definition of dyslexia, and this is really the 21st century definition of dyslexia, which has now uh, been codified by uh, Senator Cassidy and Senator Mikulski in the uh, Cassidy-Mikulski uh, resolution uh, in the Senate. And, and this is the, here, dyslexia is defined as an unexpected difficulty in reading for an individual who has the intelligence be a much better reader. And we now know that this is due with difficulty in getting to the individual sounds of spoken language, which affects the ability of an individual to speak, to read, spell, and often learn a second language. Here is data that supports the, uh, uh, the, the unexpected nature of dyslexia. <coughs> Typically, we have IQ along this line, and reading along this line, and reading and IQ are, are dynamically linked. Sally calls them kissing cousins. IQ affects reading, reading affects IQ, and so on. In dyslexic readers, in contrast, IQ and reading are very much separated. They don't seem to be talking to one another. And what, what it means is that in dyslexic readers, you can be very smart and still not read very well. And uh, this supports the unexpected nature of this dyslexia. Senator Cassidy mentioned that uh, dyslexia is the most common of uh, learning disabilities. In fact, it represents 80 to 90 percent of all children diagnosed as having a learning disability. We know that dyslexia is universal. It affects all racial, ethnic, and social groups, and we know and it affects one in five children. That is 10 million children in our country. Every classroom has children who are struggling readers. And we know the neural basis of dyslexia. Study after study, this, this is an illustration from one of our own studies, showing the left side of the brain, the right side, and the left side, and typical readers, and the left side of the brain, and dyslexic readers. And what we see is what we call the neural signature for dyslexia. That is, Typical readers, we see these three systems for reading, one in the front of the brain and two in the back of the brain. In dyslexic readers, we have the neural signature, and that is an inefficient functioning of those systems on the left side of the back of the brain. So what we now know in dyslexia is there's not a knowledge gap. We have plenty of knowledge, but what we have is an action gap, and our goal it's yours, is to align education with 21st century science. Uh, I will uh, continue. So this is a little bit of the background, the scientific background of dyslexia. Now that we have that, we have to focus on what are the action plans? How do we act on that? And a major question is what is dyslexia? What does dyslexia look like? And I'll just very quickly, I don't think for people in the room with you right now would respond this way, but far too many people, when you ask them what's dyslexia, they get a puzzled look and say, well, 
Oh yeah, that's when you read or see letters backwards. Yeah. So uh, Senator Cassidy mentioned our conceptual model, which is what I see as a sea of strengths. And here you can see, and what we envision is encapsulated weakness in decoding and later on in fluid weaving. But that encapsulated weakness is surrounded by a sea of strengths in higher level cognitive function, critical thinking, reasoning, concept formation, problem solving. So you have this paradox, you have the weakness and the strength. So the goal is to identify the weakness and remediate it, but also to identify the strengths and allow students and others access to these strengths and that is most typically accomplished through accommodation. So this is very important. We've come to a stage of science where in dyslexia, where we have a pretty good idea of the origin of the difficulties, and that is the individual who's dyslexic has difficulty getting to the sentence of spoken language. So, that tells us what to look for. What are the symptoms of dyslexia? They're not sort of random. They make sense in light of what science has taught us about dyslexia. So if you have difficulty getting to the sounds of spoken language, you'll have symptoms of difficulty with spoken language. Very often, a word retrieval. The person, the child, and or the adults know what they want to say, and the problem isn't at a higher level, but actually at a lower level in actually uttering the word. People who are dyslexic have trouble associating the letters with the sounds that represent the letters, affecting initially accurate reading and over time fluent reading, which is the ability to not only act graphically, automatically, and with good comprehension. It will affect spelling. And also, the ability, if you've had difficulty learning your basic primary spoken language, you can almost predict that that individual will have difficulty learning a second language, a foreign language. So here we have the science and the knowledge, but yet it's not getting translated. There's a, it's stopped. And so what are the barriers? And it, it's amazing. There are very far too often schools who are unwilling to diagnose or even accept a diagnosis of dyslexia. It doesn't make sense, but that's the way it is. Or schools will say, I don't believe in dyslexia. And my response to that is, in the case of religion, choose whatever religion to believe in. But in the case of the sun, an entity, it's not a case of I believe or don't, it's a fact. And in order to help our children, we have to utilize the science about dyslexia. Also, I'm so happy that uh, discussions of accommodations are also part of this hearing, because very often schools fail to provide both the evidence-based interventions and accommodations. And very important, Yes, children have difficulty in reading, but they have difficulty, as I mentioned, in spelling, uh, in uh, learning a foreign language, and these difficulties affect the whole child. So a barrier is thinking in very narrow silos and not broadening our interest in the child and in the whole child. This is very exciting. Uh, what you're seeing here are data that come from a paper that will appear in the Journal of Pediatrics next month and is already online currently. So you can see here the orange represents typical readers, the blue dyslexic readers, and here are the grades school. And you can see this is the achievement gap between typical and dyslexic readers. Look over here. Look at that, this is first grade. Look at the size of that achievement gap. 
So people say, oh, let's wait until third or fourth grade. That's too late. You, the achievement gap in a very big one is already present in first grade. We must screen for dyslexia, identify it, and then provide evidence-based uh, effective treatment for it. So what do we do about it? Well, uh, Dr. Ben and Shaywitz and I, um, uh, you know, really uh, are passionate about dyslexia. So it turns out we often visit schools, speak to many people, and uh, do the search. And our very firm conclusion is that the, in the, it is in the best interest of the dyslexic child to attend a specialized school for dyslexia. And that's in the keeping with having an early diagnosis and early intervention, screening students with dyslexia early on. And a specialized school is where the climate is, is, is right. And by that I mean the atmosphere in the school where everyone is on board. It's not just the, the reading interventionist that pulls the child out for 45 minutes twice a week, but it's every teacher. It's the principal. It's the PE teacher. Everyone's on board, and that becomes incredibly important. Classes are small. Evidence-based methods are used. The teachers are knowledgeable, flexible, and caring. And this is really important. What you have in a specialized school is consistency in instruction across all classes, which is very different if the child's in a regular school and is pulled out um, you know, for the 45 minutes or so. What happens when that child goes to his or her history class or social studies? The teachers typically have no idea what that child's reading is like. So whereas the reading may be one way during the reading instruction, it, it doesn't cross into other areas of instruction. In fact, teachers may be angry at the student. Oh, I thought you knew this. Why can't you answer this question? And what happens when you have a specialized school, the teachers form a team. They all communicate and support one another because they want to support the child. That's very rare in non-specialized schools. <coughs> Here's a wonderful school. It's the Windward School in New York, and they do wonderful work. The tuition, $52,000 a year. I think it's good for those who can afford it, but think of how many people can. What about middle class and disadvantaged children? So the question is, that's one model. Are there any other models that work? I'll say they are, and right where you all are, here's a model that works. The Specialized School for Dyslexia, the Louisiana Key Academy, which is free to all dyslexic students. I see there, hello, Principal Evelyn, I see Teacher Gail Smith, and I see my hero, Dr. Laura Cassidy, who not only started this school, but works harder than almost anyone I know to make sure this school serves all children optimally. And there. Okay. Hold on. Okay. 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 We're trying to fix something. Oh, I thought you were through, so we, you got a couple more slides. <laughs> I'll try to get it. Yeah. Okay, I'll try to go quickly. I'm from New York, so I can't speak very quickly. <laughs> um, accommodations basically are essential to dyslexic students based on scientific knowledge, the law, and ethics. Students who are dyslexic can often think at the highest levels, but they can't be fluently, quickly, automatic. And it's critical to test to measure ability rather than disability and accommodations level playing field. So it's especially important in high school to test that they be appropriate for students who are dyslexic or the results will be incorrect and misleading. And I must say, uh, the Cassidy office 
has been in the forefront of supporting students in terms of accommodations. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Um, All right. So there's, uh, there are both <laughs> options. So there's neurologic evidence for the point. I won't go into it now. Um, the recommendation the school should uh, ignore it and to create and support specialized schools like the state-of-the-art LKA model, to use the word, and this is the most, this last slide, to provide students with the knowledge that he is dyslexic. That's empowering because it provides the student with self-understanding and self-awareness of what she or he has and what they need to do. It also provides students with the community to join. They know they're not alone. And the parent, teacher, and importantly, the student, the knowledge that she or he is dyslexic brings with it the information that that student is not stupid or lazy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reverend, why don't you go first to your mind? And that, you have five minutes, and green means go, and yellow means you got a minute, red means you have time. That's okay. Go. Oh, again, my name is Mary Montgomery. Oh, they're turning on the microphone now. Okay. Oh. Again, my name is Darius Montgomery. I have been in the education fight for about two or three years now. I, I joined this fight as an advocate originally with Stand for Children. Uh, I learned some uh, horrific data that 71% um, of fourth grade along with 78 percent of the eighth graders weren't able to read at grade level. And it kind of, it, it, it frustrated me because I remember being one of those, probably one of the 71 percent of fourth graders that couldn't read. And thanks to my parents moving to Atlanta, Georgia, where I attended middle school, called Fort Middle School there, I got access to uh, resources that were not offered uh, to me here in Louisiana, so hearing, you know, that dyslexia, uh, and that's when I discovered I was dyslexic when I uh, moved to Atlanta. There is, can you speak a little louder? Please? Nope, can you hear me? Okay, uh, when I realized that I was dyslexic, uh, I didn't find out until an adult, but when I looked at all the studies and, and I saw some of the, you know, the main symptoms, the reading and the comprehension piece, that kind of disturbed me because I remember, I mean, I'm a grown man, I'm a father of three, a husband now, but I remember getting teased, you know, for, for, for not simply being able to comprehend and, and read at my grade level. And I wouldn't really say that my teacher uh, didn't care about me. I just believe maybe she didn't have the resources in our little town of Opelousas to actually identify those traits that could have probably given me the education and career that I needed here, right here in Louisiana, uh, but I had to go away. And so when I think about other students, uh, those who are right there in my community in the church that I serve, you know, those kids can't just get up, pack up, and go to another state uh, to receive that quality of education. And so um, when I learned at the Cassidy School, uh, I quickly, you know, wanted to jump on board because this is something that I feel not only can be a partnership with our local school district here, but we get to educate other teachers across our state on what it really, you know, what, what it really means to be dyslexic and how we all can work together to provide uh, those tools to those teachers so that, you know, we don't have any more kids falling through the gap. Uh, that's all I have, doesn't it? Elise? Hello, I'm Elise Trapp, I'm a senior here at LSU. It sounds like I was the exception living in home in Louisiana. I was diagnosed in first grade. My parents immediately noticed that I was way behind all the students in my class. I wasn't reading as well. I'll, that graph you showed was perfect, a perfect example of how, you know, the students in my class, you read something, they understood it. When I read it, it just went right out. I had no idea what I'm looking at. And so my parents were quick enough to catch it, having diagnosed and found out I was dyslexic in the first grade. So at my school, when you're dyslexic or AD, ADHD, you are put into the project degree program in second grade. 
second grade through fifth grade, you're put into this program, and they take you out of the classroom for your English and your reading, and they do multi-sensory things with you, like wrap your vocabulary with this fan, and make some flashcards with your vocabulary with, which I still do that in college. And so they teach you a bunch of ways to study. Please pull that microphone oh. because people are listening online. Oh, I'm so sorry. So just a little bit closer. Okay. And so they taught me different ways to study, and they went all the way back to the beginning, you know, how to, the basic words like it, cat, sat, just things I should have learned in kindergarten, but just, I didn't, because I just, you know, I couldn't, just couldn't retain it. So that's what Project Read did for me, and because I had that program, I caught up with everyone else in my grade, and by the time I was in fifth grade, and I was out of the Project Read program, and put to the resource program, I was caught up. And that's because I it was caught early. And yes, it does happen as early as first grade. Even I could have gotten diagnosed in kindergarten if they really wanted to. I was that far behind that early. Like I remember not even learning how to tell a time on a watch, like an actual watch, until I was in eighth grade, learning Spanish. Because I didn't learn that in first grade. So one ring, one out the other. So the accommodations, I can't even stress the importance of it. My life completely changed after I had accommodations. If I didn't have that, I would be at LSU. I would be in Homa, God knows why. I wouldn't be in school, that's for sure. So it completely changed my life because before that, I don't remember this because I was young. My mom said I'd come home, I'd be discouraged, I had no motivation, had low self esteem. What like kindergarten do you know that has low self esteem? If students are like them, because they see all the other students who are picking up everything, who are learning everything, and they're not. And just like, what's wrong with me? Why am I dumb? It's not, there's, there's nothing wrong with the student. It's just they have to learn a different way. And that's what these accommodations taught me, is that I am just as smart as everyone else. I just have to learn a different way. And that's what having all the accommodations through elementary school and high school, and now in college, gave me. I had extra time to ACT, and thank, I'm so thankful for that, because if I didn't have that, I would not be at LSU. I would not have gotten that score that I needed. And I had unlimited test time. I could take each, each section as long as I wanted to you know. I zipped through certain sections, but I took that math section for two hours. So, and that got me here. I just need small little things like that got me where I need to be. And because I had a few teachers that really cared about me and really want the best for me, I had a few small accommodations and parents that cared about me and wanted to be diagnosed, I'm here. I have a great future ahead of me. I'm planning to go get my master's in business administration, something that wouldn't even be a concept if I hadn't been diagnosed. It's all because I was, I was caught early and I was given a few small accommodations early on. And I think every student had that, everyone, would, they would all be fine. They'd all be in college, they'd all be productive, high motivated, high educated. They have the world to be. I think that's something that definitely needs to happen. So that's all I think. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation to participate in the for a class that is really uh, near and dear to my heart and that is the uh, My contribution will be from the perspective of the dyslexia and uh, the EOCs for those kids in college. But the goal of high school, the goal of accommodation is to provide the dyslexic student with the support they need to succeed. Two of the most critical accommodations I want to talk about are extended time and test for the lab. Extended time is needed for, needed for those kids who have poor decoding abilities or they're very slow at reading. Um, I was at, I'm asked at what point, how much constitutes extended time. Um, I had a conversation with the 504 coordinator for the state and she told me that extended time uh, should be based on what the child needs. You should observe, see how much time it takes to take a test and then that's what they should be given. Tests read aloud um, are needed for the phonological deficits. Um, when a student has to try to read something they can't read, it causes anxiety, it causes stress. Um, I have two examples to share for you. I met this young man in uh, our school system in middle school. He was identified with characteristics of dyslexia and assigned tests read aloud and accommodations. He is a talented athlete. Um, he finished the MSL program in uh, ninth grade. Um, he has been offered a scholarship already to play his chosen sport um, at a college. Accommodations helped him keep his GPA up so that he could do that. He is going to live his dream because he was able to get the accommodations that he needs. Uh, as a matter of fact, the college has already contacted me and asked me what accommodations he will need to succeed in college. 
so I thought that was great. A second student I met when I was an academic therapist uh, in a private school, a, a high school teacher came to tell me that she had a struggling reader. I met with him, he had his hoodie up over his head, you couldn't see him, I said, what, what can I do for you? He said, I want to be able to read like everybody else. So he, had, he was tested, entered our MSL program, received accommodations. Um, the biggest thing for him was that his reading improved, but the big thing was his self-confidence improved. And one of his teachers told me that he actually volunteered to read in class. That is a feat that dyslexic students shies away from. And she was very proud of him. And it was great to see him in the hallway. He wasn't hidden in his hoodie. He was looking at people and he was smiling. Uh, the um, IEP and the accommodations needed um, change over time. Uh, the parent is always the advocate when they are younger. As the child gets older, uh, they become advocates for themselves. They set in on the IEP reviews. Yes, I need that accommodation. It's data-driven. They receive those um, accommodations. Um, college, as um, they've already spoken about, I get parents who ask me about accommodations in college. And there are no official 504 plans in college. The student has to be an advocate and go to the disabilities department where they ask for accommodations. The college will ask for documentation that they have that disability. And then they will uh, ask for documentation on what uh, they used, it, what, which ones they were given in high school. And then they will um, decide if those accommodations are merited and they can earn them in, um, at the college level. So in conclusion, in conclusion, accommodations support the dyslexic students. They lead to academic success. They build self-confidence. And most of the time, and many times, they let that student achieve the goal uh, of what they want to do or a personal goal. Thank you. Um, now, I, um, uh, this is a Senate hearing. So I, unfortunately, y'all are not allowed to ask questions. I hope nobody walks out. But what I'll try to do is, based on what we've heard, ask questions that would hopefully reflect what your interests are. Darius, it wasn't until you described up until fourth grade, you're recognized as bright, and no one knows what's going on with you. Were you the young man wearing the hoodie that wouldn't wanted to read but couldn't? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, and, and number one, number two, I'd just like to know how you felt. And number two, when you went to Atlanta, what was it about that teacher that she recognized the sign of dyslexia? What did they do to help you? So, to answer both questions, for me, it was not only being held back in first grade, but the telltale sign was being held back in the sixth grade and moving to Atlanta. The teacher saw my academic track record, and nothing indicated that I was a problematic child or anything like that. Uh, but reading, the comprehension piece, uh, and, I, and again, all of this is secondhand because my mom told me most of it, right? Uh, so I don't have that great of a memory. But I do remember, as a second time sixth grader, being told that Louisiana had cheated you. And I really didn't understand what that meant. And, that came, I'm actually saying it nice, because the teacher I had, she was really, for lack of a better word, she was pissed off. Because she thought I was one of those children that had just been passed along, you see. And so what they had at this particular school was a jumpstart program. That program was devised for kids like myself who were very highly intelligent, however, our academic careers didn't line up to, to our personalities. And so I remember it was me and about 12 other students in that particular Jumpstart program. And I must, must say, by the end of that school year, I was actually going into high school, into the eighth grade. That's how much intensity, however, I mean, not only was the work intense, but it was tailor-made just for us. And I didn't, I didn't have to deal with the issue of being pulled out of the class and, given IEP uh, or anything like that and being labeled back in my day, uh, it was the retarded kids, right, that had to go into a different setting. So for me, you know, just being able to go through that was liberating. Uh, graduating on time and, and having, you know, being able to graduate on time, having younger sisters 
coming up behind me who were straight A students. So me being the only boy, I mean, it just did something to my self confidence, knowing that that opportunity was there for me. So. Margaret, Louisiana Chew. I'm told that a typical parish in Louisiana has less than one percent of its students identified as dyslexic. Um, so I guess, could you comment to that and then tell us, is there, is it just that there is a teacher who's aware of the issue that then notifies someone such as you, or is there a formal screening program? If not, should there be? Um, well, first I guess I'll have to say that in our district we have about 3% of our kids identified, so we're a little bit wrong now. We have a lot to do though, but um, I, I think that uh, part of the problem is that there's not funding. This comes under 504 and 504 is an unfunded law. So there's not funding, even though districts have um, in place procedures to identify their kids with characteristics of dyslexia. And, there, and in Bulletin 1903, it says you have to do that between kindergarten and third grade. So if that is not done by the district, for whatever reason, then that definitely penalizes the child. So funding to me is always a way where you can get more personnel and maybe get people to follow the law um, the way they're supposed to follow the law. And then it's education. Um, you know, I talked to a teacher who's a new teacher and I asked her, I said, what kind of um, coursework did you have in college on dyslexia? And she said, well, in my special ed class, we had a little bit about it. And that they also had um, a, sim a simulation that they did of the dyslexia program. But I still don't think there's enough information out there. And that's still part of the problem. So as someone who's not, then I'll ask Sally or Bennett to address this. I have to admit, it affects 20% of the population is the principal cause for children reading below grade level. But the only instruction she received was a little bit about it in a special ed course. It seems as if there should be more. Yes, I agree. Sally Bennett, uh, would you want to comment upon, um, on that particular issue? Sure. Well, it just strikes me as, as somehow um, odd because I've heard that in Louisiana uh, people entering prison are screened for dyslexia so that we can do it for prisons but not for children entering school and perhaps help them avoid prison. Um, I, I think schools and education can do a lot more than they're doing. I think they need to introduce dyslexia, what is known about dyslexia, what programs are evidence-based uh, as well. But I also think that it's not just a matter of reading about dyslexia. Uh, you know, turning pages, getting tested, and I think what needs to be done in addition to coursework is to actually find an intern and optimally uh, specialized schools like LKA can serve as a resource where teachers, budding teachers can go and spend time with the students and learn what, what does a dyslexic student look like? How, how do they react in class? What are the most effective approaches to the students? Because students are not only going to have a reading difficulty, many, many more issues. So as we, uh, Senator Cassidy and Benjamin and myself, as physicians, we went to uh, medical school, but we learned even more <coughs> practical importance when we were interns and residents. So I think any mode has to be linked to an actual experiential approach. Now, um, Sally, you mentioned it in your talk, but could I ask you to also address once more um, if, how would, how would a, Elise was, her parents suspected Elise had an issue in kindergarten or first grade. I am so impressed with that. Uh, my daughter, I was totally unaware until she was older. My wife is, is rolling her eyes right now, saying I'm always going to be unaware. Uh, but what would you ask a parent to look for or a teacher to look for 
when the child is in uh, kindergarten or first grade? Yeah, well, see, that's the really exciting thing about scientific progress because now that we know that the basic difficulty is getting to the sounds of spoken language, we can look for not even non reading signs. For example, even early, early on delayed language, a toddler not appreciating nursery rhyme because in order to appreciate a nursery rhyme, you have to be able to pull apart the spoken word and focus just on the end, you know, mad, cat, cat. So these children not only don't appreciate nursery rhymes, they often lack an appreciation of any kind of rhyme. They may mispronounce verbs um, and have difficulty learning and remembering the names of letters where they don't even know the letters in their own name. And as they go on to move on to first grade, it's difficult for them to appreciate that spoken words come apart, like cowboy is made up of two parts, cow and boy. They have a great inability to associate letters with sounds, and the reading yet show no relationship to of the letter to the sound. And what's really upsetting is these children sooner than we often appreciate turn off of reading. They explain how hard reading is, and when it's time for reading, they get run away or learn that. If their behavior is bad, they get asked to leave the room so they don't have to be called on to read aloud. So I, I think it's important for parents to be aware of this, but also not to accept, oh, this is just developmental, or she'll outgrow it, or it's just a glitch. It has to be attended to and not excuses and delays except. Let me also ask you to comment. Darius's testimony spoke. Uh, once he was identified, he sounded like it was boot camp for reading. And for a year, it was wrapped around and pervasive. You mentioned in your testimony, I think, Sally, that 20 minutes twice a week is not adequate. So again, could you just speak to that? OK, well, I'm, I'm really glad you asked me about that. You know, dyslexia affects the whole child. It's not in a silo that if you pull the child out and inject them with some instruction, that'll solve it. What happens, one, if that happens, the child comes back to school place where they've missed what's going on. That child also, when he or she goes to an, another subject, social studies, history, literature, the teacher has no idea about the child's reading problem. And uh, the child's expected to do what everybody else does. And very often, the teachers will get frustrated or annoyed. Why don't you know this without any idea of what the child's um, uh, reading is? So what you need, and what I had said previously, is to have the teacher in each child's subject class be aware of where he or she is in reading, what helps them, what's effective and to be able to follow uh, the students carefully that there's consistency in uh, an instruction. So you need to be in a school where the climate is all hands on board. So the climate and the instruction to dyslexic students is all unified and the needs of the whole child are met during the entire day rather than the artificial belief that giving a child a package of instruction for a small period of day will address the significant ongoing needs of a dyslexic child. Elise, I know you told me earlier you attended Vanderbilt Catholic. Vanderbilt Catholic is a parochial school, you might guess, which has instruction for dyslexic students integrated in. Now, Sally, Dr. Ben, Dr. Sally Shea was just said you want to integrate, but I do get a sense that Vanderbilt Catholic does integrate instruction for dyslexia. Could you speak to that and your experience at Vanderbilt Catholic? Integrate as in, the only thing that they did differently was that they would, if you, you had the option, you had the option to take out the classroom, which is something I found interesting. Because yes, they would teach you in class, you never had you to bring leave. bring your microphone to you, please? You never had to leave the classroom cool. at Vanderbilt. Oh. Just bring right to your list. Okay. You never had to leave the classroom at Vanderbilt. Unlike at St. Francis, when I was in elementary school, you could leave the classroom. Once you got to high school, you were in class with everyone, and all the teachers knew 
they knew who was disabled, who had a disability. And you only had to leave class if you wanted to, and that's only during test taking time. And that was only if you want a you know a quiet place to go to and you want teachers there who can read the test to you. But I honestly didn't even need that by the time I got there because I had that was for people who were diagnosed late. That was for late in the game. And so yeah, it was pretty much integrated by the time I got to Fanville. I was very lucky to be in a parish that already had a really sound system in place for students with learning disabilities. But I'm struck you advocate for yourself at LSU. Margaret said, listen, oftentimes in college you have to go and tell folks, listen, I need an accommodation. You had just told us that when you take the math test, you are accommodated for. So I, I know that, um, I think one of Sally's slides I took notes from, the child has to learn to advocate for herself or himself. I gather that your experience with dyslexia appears to have taught you that ability to self-advocate. Fair statement? Oh, absolutely. You have to know how to advocate for yourself because you won't always have a parent or a teacher there doing it for you. You have to be able to explain yourself because when you get on the playground as a child, you're not going to have a teacher there telling your friends why we're not in class today. You're not going to have a parent there explaining to other students you meet why you speak differently, why you do things differently from them. You have to be able to advocate for yourself. By the time you get to high school, most people know, most of your friends understand, but you'll always have a friend that says, I don't believe in dyslexia, or I don't think you're very smart. And you have to advocate for yourself. That's when you have to step up to the plate and say, you don't have to believe the real thing, but it is. And that's just some, you, you don't have to believe it. I took, it's, it took me four years to get one of my very best friends to actually believe that I was dyslexic and it was a real learning ability. He thought I was just lazy, and I didn't want to study. Which that was not the case. If you saw the stack of flashcards I had in my room each day, that was not the case. So you have to advocate for yourself. You have to be your number one champion, honestly. Because if you don't tell people what's going on with you and you don't understand yourself and your own learning disability, how do you expect anyone else to? And how do you, how do you expect these accommodations? Now, Darius, I'm struck. You now advocate for others. And your empathy with the children who struggle brought you to seek out the opportunity to serve on a board that would minister to those struggling children. I think that's what I gathered. Would you comment on that? Yes, and the fact that I have uh, three toddler boards that I'm raising right now uh, was, was the fire that, that was lit. You know? And I don't want them to go through, uh, my wife and I probably driving through fraud crazy uh, that's where my oldest son attend because we're very, very much so involved. And, you know, I mean, his mom is smart, right? Dad is the one with a little struggle. So anything <laughs> that he deals with, of course, they're looking on my side. And we just want to make sure that he's accommodated properly. So, uh, you know, when I think about the lack of father in my own family in terms of relatives, I have no choice but to advocate for kids outside of my you mentioned your child in first grade. Um, Bennett, if I can ask you, uh, right now we're trying to do a reauthorization of what is called the No Child Left Behind or the Elementary Secondary Education Act. And, um, and one of the things that has come up is standardized testing. And so, Bennett, could you speak to standardized testing uh, and the dyslexic, please? Well, yeah, I think this is a really important point, as uh, Senator Cassidy. Is here, uh, I didn't get a chance to show these earlier, but I think that it's really critical for everybody to understand that the, the standardized tests that are used in dyslexic students are quite, uh, are, are in fact um, inappropriate for dyslexic students. I'm talking, for example, I'm talking about the state standards and the part which is designed to measure those standards. There, those that that state standard and the part are inappropriate for dyslexic elementary students because they're, the, the, the the common core standards and the part are based on the mistaken belief, and this is in the this is in the descriptions of the common core that all students, including dyslexic students, will be fluent readers by the end of second grade. That's what that's what comes course to names. And and that's just not true. It doesn't it's not true for dyslexic students. And it also 
Common Core says all students, including dyslexic students, should read at grade level and above. Well, for dyslexic students, that's just not the case. Um, the the uh, Common Core standards are focused, they are comprehension focused the, the, for reading instruction. Reading instruction says that you should use complex tests that should be the basis of all reading instruction, and they ignore whether or not the student can actually read the words in a complex test. And, and this really has serious implications for dyslexic students. For example, every, every, anybody who's ever looked at the third grade bar, see that uh, third grade students are more targeted to reading, the, the part of the third grade students is more targeted to reading level of the fifth grade, and it's focused on reading comprehension. And that's just not, it, 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 dyslexic students, I mean, it's very inappropriate for dyslexic And it has the pernicious effect of schools dropping all other instruction, including much needed decoding instruction, to focus almost exclusively on comprehension. In addition, those multiple choice questions in the FAR are really inappropriate for students who are dyslexic who need a lot more context to be able to understand. And everybody should understand that, this, that the Common Core's focus on comprehension may be appropriate for students in high school or, or, or perhaps uh, upper level junior high school, but it's wholly inappropriate for children in very early grades, especially dyslexic students, who are invariably still struggling and working very hard to master the code. The danger is that, it pro that the part will provide misleading data with very serious consequences, not only for the student, parents, and for the teachers. It, it's not that, that, that the students are, 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 are not doing what they do. The test is inappropriate. It should not be in dyslexic students. Uh, Sally, did you have something to say? Yeah. Uh, I was listening to how helpful accommodations are in self-advocacy, and I thought we heard that schools report that they identify 3% of the population as dyslexic when we know that it's, I'm doing quick math here, that it's times more common. So think of all the children who can self-advocate because they don't know what they have. They've never been identified. They can't have, even though they're dyslexic, they can't have the benefit of accommodations because they don't know they're dyslexic. So it's such a huge disservice on so many levels to not identify dyslexic children. Not only don't they receive the intervention and the appropriate schooling, but it follows them to life. They think they're not smart. They don't have self-awareness. They can't advocate for themselves. And even though they're, self, they're slow readers, because they are just they can't even think of or apply for or receive accommodation. So it keeps them back all through life. And that's not fair. We're better as a nation than that. And we can't know about dyslexia at the level of a school but then just ignore the children who need us. So, Margaret, that um, raises the issue. You mentioned the 504 is unfunded. What, would it, what does it cost to, to screen all first graders or all elementary school kids or all new transfers? Well, I never put an actual uh, number to the cost, but in time, it takes, um, like, we have 350 kids in second grade, so starting in January, begin the universal screening. It takes a team of uh, teachers to go through uh, the process of all the steps that you have to do for that to identify all of the students and then pull the ones at risk and then administer tests to them. So it's a lot of time for the counselor uh, who does the testing. I would say the second semester a counselor probably spends 50% of their time looking at universal screening and in our school system and we have about 350 kids as I said that we look at. 350 first graders or 300? Uh, we do second grade. So we do second grade. In January, second grade is our year to do universal screening. Now let me ask, and Sally Bennett, y'all can also weigh in on this. Is yeah, well, I, given the 
data that we now have, strong published scientific data, showing that that achievement gap is already present in first grade, my hope is, ah, oh, there it is, that we would rethink our approach to screening and begin to, as early as possible, kindergarten, first grade, there are measures, um, both for the child, but also in new measures that teachers can use. Because that gap, it's so hard to overcome. It's there already. So I think we have an obligation to our children and to our teachers to identify this at the earliest possible time. Because it, it's so hard to overcome, and it's you. It really is very, very hard. And it's now supported by scientific data. I'm struck in support of that. Elise mentioned when she went to high school, she had been accommodated early and therefore did not need as much help. Those who had not been diagnosed until later in their education were the ones who still needed help. So the absence of early screening intervention ends up having delayed, I'm sorry, persistent effects into adolescence. Again, Sally and Bennett, does the data show that? Yeah, yeah. in fact, it, uh, it is persistent. Oh, my goodness. Um, it's persistent, and you have the additional difficulties of not having, knowing what you are, thinking you're stupid, not wanting to go to school, all the other consequences, and also to avoid reading. And the, we get better reading by reading. So there are so many negative consequences and it becomes more and more difficult uh, to remediate. We've had the personal experience of trying to work with middle schoolers versus working with first, kindergarten and first graders. There's no comparison. We really have to get there early. And when we think of, oh, it's costly, what is the cost to society and to the deal of the child not being identified and not receiving what that child needs? That's huge on a personal level, on a family level, and on a national level. Yes. Uh, I'll point out, I read once, that you can look at illiteracy rates, no, I'm sorry, poor reading rates at third grade and predict the number of prison cells you need uh, 20 years later. And so if the cost of a prisoner, I think, is $50,000 a year or something such as that. Uh, so if we could somehow understand that and do something at the earlier stage. Um, see if there's any other questions I have that I wanted to ask. Um, by the way, I'm also struck with these. I feel like to totally comfortable with dyslexia. Again, almost fighting with your friend to kind of prove, you know, come on, guy, get off it. <laughs> and I speak to some who are older, and they don't want anyone to know. I know an 80-year-old guy, incredibly successful, uh, and doesn't want anyone to know that he's dyslexic. Even though he's so successful, it wouldn't matter. And so, clearly, at some point, it just became you, like you have blonde hair and you're tall or whatever, <laughs> and it's nothing to have a shame of. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely. I can't understand why someone who's successful would want to talk about how he got to success with dyslexia. I think that's something incredible to share with everyone how he did that. I'm thinking of Walt Disney have dyslexia. I think that's incredible that it shows you that you don't have to have, you know, the regular processing brain to do incredible things. And I'm totally comfortable with it because I don't know anything else. I don't know what it's like to have a regular functioning brain. I only know the brain that I have, and I love the brain that I have. Yeah, sometimes when I'm really frustrated with it, I'm just like, oh my gosh, I wish I wish I knew what it was like having a different brain, but I don't. I work with what I have and I go with it. And that's just part of me. I'm an extremely confident person and I haven't done a little thing. And when I was down at the I'm like, all right, cool, one more thing. Let's work with it. And I had so many teachers and who was like, this isn't an hindrance, it's just something else to work on. It's not a big deal. And I have parents who said, it's okay, we're just gonna work with it. And all my friends were fine with it growing up. And of course, he had this friend that was like, I don't believe it's a real thing. But he came around. My senior in high school, he said, it's real. No joke. 
you see it in action for four years. You know, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's, there's nothing wrong with me. It's just a different way of thinking. And it's a whole new window of creativity and opportunity. And I'm doing just fine with it. And so I'm totally fine with it. It's a comfortable setting for me. I'm comfortable with my dyslexia. I'm comfortable with my disability. And it's not, I only find to be a disability because as I work on it, it's not holding back. Jerry, as you were diagnosed later in life, and you frankly, you recounted how you had a real struggle prior to that point. Do you find that your attitude towards having a self-diagnosis of dyslexia is different than Elisa's or exactly the same? I think mine's exactly the same. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to, to identify with it, uh, but I have to look at my own successes in my own life. You know, with the disability, I, I've still been able to you know, get married, finish school, going back to school. You know, I started a small business here in Baton Rouge. And, and so I, I, I have achieved, you know, the American dream. And I'm still trying to achieve, I'm only 31, so I have a lot more to conquer. And I think that only, you know, would motivate one to continue to speak out. Cool. Let me ask if there's any final comments. Uh, Sally and Bennett, do y'all have any final comments? <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, it won't be surprising that I do. Uh, and that is, if we remember that dyslexia is a paradox, if we think of the sea of strengths model, we have that encapsulated weakness in decoding, getting to the sounds spoken. We also have those higher level strengths. So the way we look at it is when a child starts school, they can go in either direction. What will it be the weakness that characterizes their life or the strengths? And that will be determined, are they identified? Are they in the proper school? Are they have the proper intervention? People who are dyslexic are filling out prisons, but they're also receiving Nobel Prizes and Pulitzer Prizes. So the capabilities go in both directions. We as a society are letting them down by not identifying and providing for their needs. And again, I just have to say, um, having visited and uh, seen what happens at LKA, um, a specialized public charter school, that's giving so many children the opportunity, disadvantaged children, children of color, that they would not have had. And that can help ensure that it's the strengths rather than the weakness that characterizes their future lives. Good. Uh, we, I'll leave it there. I can't hard to follow Sally. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, anything else? Um, I think one of the things I want to uh, point out is that um, the students who have dyslexia have to have a specialized program in order for them to um, be a better reader and to be successful. And in the state of Louisiana, to my knowledge, there are no colleges or training centers where you can train to be an academic language therapist. Uh, when I decided I wanted to go into the field of dyslexia, I had to go to Texas to do my training. And so there's nowhere in the state it would seem that perhaps a community college or something could be done so that we could train and have a certified academic language therapist um, training center in our state. Um. Elise. I'll say thanks so much for having me today. I really appreciate you giving me a chance to talk about what it's like growing up dyslexia and hopefully helping in some small way other students to get to Jerry, is your friend. Uh, I'm with these two here. Just thank you for the opportunity, and I think that um, as long as we continue to have these type of discussions, uh, both privately and publicly, I think the whole community will, will uh, get behind this movement. <clears throat> you start to see more people stand up and advocate for students of this lesson. I'll finish by, first, uh, Evelyn Gotro, we've talked about LKA. She is the principal, so let me just point her out uh, right there, right there. Um, um, and let me just echo what Sally said, her observation. It seems as if the diagnosis of dyslexia leads one to a point. And if there's appropriate remediation, accommodation, the struggle to overcome, and then the subsequent success actually leads to insights that one would not otherwise have. If everyone is thinking like this, 
the dyslexic is the out of the box thinker who thinks so creatively when others are just in a path. If they are not kind and their needs not addressed, then it is not an arc towards success. It is a descent into a frustrated life, which at, which at its worst ends up in prison, and at its not so bad ends up much lesser than it could be. Um, and that comes through over and over. So, that said, uh, I thank you all for being here. Um, let me, I have a script to follow. <laughs> the hearing record will remain open for 10 days for senators to submit additional comments and any questions for the record they may have. Thank you for being here today. The committee will stand adjourned.